Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, excited today to talk about state trial court data and analytics and Trellis, which you guys have access to, but I'll give another minute for folks to come on in and join. Thanks, Nicole. And while you do that, I'm Lisa with the library and I had just a few housekeeping things I wanted to mention as people are logging in. Uh, today's presentation does involve an hour of CLE credit. So for those of you who need it, um, I will be going along and looking at our Zoom account after the class is over, verifying who attended and sending out CLE certificates by email. So be looking out for that by email a little bit later. Additionally, this is an interactive presentation today, though, although you won't be able to speak if you're an attendee. We do have a way for you to ask your questions of Nicole, and we encourage you to do so. Um, there is an icon on your screen that says Q&A with two speech bubbles. That is the one we would like you to use to post questions, and you'll do that by just posting them there. You can do it anonymously or with your name, whatever you're comfortable with, and then hopefully we'll get to as many of those as possible near the end of the presentation. Another thing I wanted to mention is you will see a link for a survey at the end of the class. We'd much appreciate if some of you would take uh, a minute or two to take our quick survey. Let us know how we're doing with our programming. Um, and then just quickly, I wanted uh, from the library point of view to let you know about the access that our patrons have to Trellis at San Diego Law Library, which is one of the reasons we're talking about it today. This is a a platform that is available for free at San Diego Law Library at our downtown location. And it is also available remotely if you have a borrower account with our library. So after you hear the presentation today, if you are not already a borrower, please come see us if you'd like to become one to get that access. I think you'll find it very worthwhile. Um, yeah, so I think that's about everything I wanted to say. And hopefully everybody who's going to be with us is here now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nicole. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Lisa, and excited to dig in today. So let's see, basic bio on who I am. I am Nicole Clark. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Trellis. And prior to Trellis, I was a litigator. I practiced a lot in state trial court, uh, a lot of employment, and I just couldn't believe how difficult it was to access the state trial courts and to find out information, practical information. And so Really, that's what Trellis was born out of. It was born out of my own frustration in trying to access state trial court data. So the data that you might otherwise have to go onto a county court website to find out. So I'm excited today to talk a little bit more about what you guys have access to. And then also to tell you for anyone who is already a user, a lot of the stuff that has changed as we continue to grow and build out new features. So we're gonna talk about Coverage, what, what do we cover now? What are we continuing? Where are we continuing to grow? How do you use us to uh, access filed documents in the state trial courts? And then as well as purchase documents in some of those county courts. We have verdict data available for California. So we can talk about case valuation, exposure, how to look up some of that. Our judge analytics, a very common use case on our site. Um, how do you get analytics on a state trial court judge that you've been assigned to? And then finally, how do you share information really easily on the site or set alerts to make sure that you really stay up to date on important aspects? So let's start out with high level. What is Trellis? We are a state trial court research platform. So each of these that you see below here is something you can look up on Trellis. I like to think of us as a Google for the state trial court system. So if you think about Lexis, uh, Westlaw as being Court of Appeals data research, you think about PACER as being a way to search across the federal trial courts, think of Trellis as a way to search across the state trial courts. So what we do is we go in county by county where all of this data is fragmented on individual county court websites and we gather that data and we structure it and we normalize it and then we make it searchable from a single interface. So that when you're searching on our site, you're searching across counties, even across states, if you're looking to search across states across the nation. So really this is where we live in this giant box here of the state trial court system. So you can see Lexis and Westlaw up here. You got Pacer over here on this side, but the state trial court system where every individual county 
his its own website and host their data separately and maintain it separately. That's what we do. So for uh, we'll use California as our example for all of the superior courts across California. We bring in each of the county courts data and then we make it searchable through our interface across those counties. Coverage has continued to grow. We have incredible coverage. We're now covering 26 states across the nation and nearly a thousand counties. So if you're curious about our coverage, whether it be in a particular state um, or across states, at any point, you can go to our website and in the footer of the website will be our coverage. You can click in there and it'll break it down state by state. It'll tell you exactly what we cover um, by four features across a particular state. And if you click into a state, it will tell you exactly what we cover court by court in that state. And what do we mean when we say we cover a court? It means we go back at least 15 years of historical docket data. We recently added Arizona, Connecticut, Georgia, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. I can keep going. So we are going uh, very, very quickly trying to make sure that there is a single searchable interface to search across the state trial court system. So to start out with today, I want to talk about judge research, um, the ability to go in and get information on state trial court judges. So what's the type of information you can find out on state trial court judges? Well, you can search through their rulings. In California, those are tentative rulings. Uh, generally, those are rulings that the judge issues right before they're going to rule on the record, and it tells you the why for why a judge is going to grant or deny a particular motion, incredibly useful for substantive research. You can search all of a judge's dockets, all of their cases, high level. What are the cases that they're presiding over, uh, both currently and historically? Documents, you can search filed documents um, that were filed in cases where this judge is presiding. And then verdicts, if cases have gone all the way to final verdict before the judge, you can look up that verdict data as well. So some of the things you should think about researching about your judge is to start out with getting some high level uh, information. But the next step should really be understanding what's the core of the case that you're dealing with? What are the core legal issues? And has your judge previously ruled on those same legal issues in the past? That's something that's really helpful to know from the start of the case. And so that's one of the things you should be doing from the very start is looking up your judge and any particular causes of action or legal issues. The next thing you should do is get your judge's analytics, high level analytics for the judge. How many active cases do they have? How long do cases sit before them? It's their overall motion grant rate, et cetera. So going in and getting your judge's analytics from the start. And let's actually talk about how to do that for a moment so I can show you live. So what I'm on right now is the Trellis website. The smart search here, this is what I was talking about when I was talking about that Google for the state trial court system. When you want to search in a particular state, you simply select the state and you're searching across the state trial courts in that state. Now you can narrow by county and I'll show you how to do that in a moment, but just know that when you're searching here, whether it be judge or party or legal issue or combinations of those, you're searching across the state trial courts in that state. But let's go back to judges for a moment. If you wanna grab analytics on a judge, you're gonna come here to the judge analytics tab, make sure you're in the state that the judge is presiding and then just type in their last name. Now, what you're gonna pull is our judicial analytics dashboard. So what does that mean? Well, it means these five tabs right here. We have aggregated all of the judge's historical data and make it surface it, make it searchable for you. So the biography, what is that? Well, it's gonna be all the subjective information about the judge, career history, political affiliation, articles by and about the judge, clerk phone number, um, department rules. So everything that is really helpful to know from the start, you're gonna be able to have on one page and then jump into some of the judge's cases right here as well. So that's the biography. Now the at a glance, this is that high level zoomed out view of your judge with the overall number of cases and overall motion grant rate. A little bit lower on the page, what you're going to find is the judge's 
case calendar. What are the types of cases that this judge hears? So big pie here is practice area, which is going to load up the little pie, which is matter type. And that's a place from the start to see if the judge is very sophisticated, if they handle the particular case issue that you're dealing with very often, or if it's just not something the judge handles very often and you may need to help do some educating for the judge from the very start of the case. Now the motions tab, this is granular motion by motion analytics. So you're gonna find over here on the left-hand side, important pretrial motions that get filed in the state trial courts before the judge that you're researching. And you can click on any of these motion types to load up your judge's grant and denial rate for similar motions. One thing to note is that the judge that you're researching, their data will always be listed first, then what you're going to find is the county average and then the state average. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you have uh, some context to understand the judge's ruling analysis and understand really where the judge is an outlier in comparison to other judges, both in the county and in the state. Now, the outcomes tab here, this is just like it sounds. How are these cases actually coming out? What, what's happening in these cases? How are they concluding? So here you can drill down by practice area and then again by matter type. And then you'll see the outcome of these cases by matter type for your judge. So how many get consolidated with other cases? How many get removed to federal court, et cetera? And again, you're trying to utilize some of this data to uh, get an understanding of the likely flow of your case before the judge based on how other similar cases have moved forward. And then finally, the milestone here, uh, the uh, tab here, case milestones, this is timing analysis. So being able to set your expectations regarding how long. Uh, other cases, similar cases have sat before your judge depending on different outcomes. So again, here you can jump in by practice area and then again by matter type. And average case duration, what we're looking at here is the average number of days that the case sits across all outcomes, whether it goes to verdict, whether it goes, uh, whether it gets settled. But you have a couple additional ways to drill down. What if this is a case that just isn't going away that you're going to need to go all the way through trial? How long will you expect to be before your judge if the case has to go to a final verdict? And then finally, for all the cases that don't make it to trial, which is the 99.7%, um, how long until it settles? In similar matter types, when are these cases usually settling? And what we track to is the judge entering the order of dismissal in a case, which is usually a proxy for the case having been settled. So that's the analytics to start with that you should be thinking about as soon as you know who the judge is, if you are in front of a particular judge. The next thing to do is to actually mix the context with the analytics. So it's great to know high level analytics on your judge, but guess what? Facts matter, context matters. So how can you look up your judge's cases, your judge's data to really get an understanding of this judge and their, their language, their thought process on particular legal issues. Well, what you should do is really start to uh, dig in with the legal issue. So narrow to your judge's data as a starting place. How do you narrow to your judge's data? I'll go ahead and show you a live example. So I'm in a smart search here. I'm searching across California. I'm gonna put in a Los Angeles Superior Court judge. How about Honorable Neatu? So the way that I did that, I did judge colon and then the judge's last name, no space. That's an important piece to know. And what are we looking at now? This is going to narrow me to this judge's data. So you're always going to be searching for buckets of data when you're searching in our smart search rulings. In California, these are going to be tentative rulings. If you're looking at a judge, it'll be tentative rulings issued by the judge that you're researching. Dockets, high level overview, all of that judge's cases. Documents documents filed in cases where that judge is presiding and verdicts, cases that have gone to verdict before that judge. So now you're narrowed into a, spe a specific judge's data. That's great, you're in their cases, their rulings, documents filed before them, what's next? Well, the next thing is just like I mentioned, type in a legal issue that's really important in the case to get an understanding. 
So and and or are going to be your main terms and connector for adding additional search terms to, to um, narrow your search. It's very similar to searching on Google. So when you think about Google, you add additional search terms to narrow you down. Very similar. Westlaw Next is another uh, example of a natural language search where adding additional search terms will help you narrow. And that's the best way to narrow on Trellis is to continue to add and and additional relevant search terms, which will then require both of the terms. So if I wanted to find everywhere where Honorable Nia to had a disability discrimination case in the past. I put disability discrimination in quotations. I want an exact match for this. And what I want is Judge Neatu, so her data and disability discrimination cases. So now I've narrowed to this search. And now from here, I can go into a variety of these pieces of data. And let's actually look at the data together for a moment so you get an understanding of what you're looking at. So right now we're on a ruling page. This is a ruling by Honorable Nia Tu on a disability discrimination case. And this is what I was talking about when I was saying how much substantive information there is on these pages. So you can find, you can really understand the way a judge thinks about a legal issue by digging into their prior rulings. The other thing you're gonna find on a ruling page is all the case metadata. So, the case number. Anytime you click on a case number or a docket number, it's going to take you to the docket of the case. This works across counties, across states. Same with the parties below here. All of the parties listed on a page are going to be the parties involved in the case for the document that you're looking at. And clicking on any one of these parties will run a search for that party across the jurisdiction that you're researching. So if I wanted to find everywhere else where Aspen Skilled Healthcare was suing or being sued, I'm going to click on their link, and now it's going to run a search across rulings, documents, uh, dockets, and verdicts where Aspen Skilled Healthcare is involved. So that's a ruling page. What's next? How about a docket page? So what is a docket? A docket is the case itself. You can think of it as a timeline of events in a case. So I'm going to jump into this case, and when I jump into the case, it's going to be the docket of the case. Now, dockets are sometimes searchable on county court websites. So everything that you'd find searchable on a county court website for the data related to the case that you're researching, you're going to find on Trellis as well. Hopefully a lot easier to navigate and enhanced with a lot of additional information. So you're going to find all of the case metadata here, the case type, the number of days that it's at, the judge that it's before. Then you're going to find the parties. Now, under the party section, you're going to find both attorneys and the individual litigants. So if I wanted to find everywhere else where Stephen Hoagie has particular uh, cases, I'm going to click on their name. Just like running the party search, it's going to search for Stephen Hoagie's cases across the state trial court system that I'm researching. Next are going to be the case documents filed in the case. And then finally, you're going to have the actual docket entries themselves. Now, a quick note here, when you are searching, let's say you want to search for a particular event, a particular event that happened in a case. Maybe it's a case that's been going on for a very long time. If you want to narrow within a particular case within the docket, this is the search right here that you want to narrow to and just start typing the event that you're interested in, and it will go ahead and narrow you to the events that match that description. If you land on a docket page, and you want to make sure it is absolutely as up to date as possible. You can always press this update case information button. What happens here, we move this docket to the very top of our queue and we go back to the court in real time and refresh the data for you. So I'll get an email in about 30 seconds that lets me know, hey, the case is in the process of being refreshed. In fact, let me show you a quick example here. So I press the update case. And now what's happening is it is in the process of refreshing. You'll be able to see every case that you're in the process of refreshing right here. And you can say, OK, it's being refreshed. As soon as it's available, it's going to be, it'll say it's available here. And then if there are any new docket entries, any new documents that those are available, those will be searchable on the docket page as well. So you can update multiple cases at the same time while you're researching. But we, we really strive to keep our data up to date, but just remember you can always press that update case information button if for some reason uh, you want to make sure that the case is absolutely as up to date as the court's current data. So that's a docket page. 
The next thing I want to show really quickly is the verdict page. I mean, the um, file document page. So what does that mean? I'm going to jump back in. We're still narrowed to a particular judge and a particular legal issue here. So honorable need to and disability discrimination. And I'm going to jump into one of her documents. This is a complaint that was filed in a case where she's presiding. Now, something to know about our file documents, when they are on our system already, they are live and searchable. You can scroll through the entire document and find out, is it useful? Is it on point? Is it helpful for the research that you're doing? And quickly move on if it's not. But just know that when the documents are on our system, they are live and searchable, meaning the body and text of the documents are searchable. So that is absolutely helpful to know. The other thing to note is if you're looking for, let's say the case is useful, but you don't want this document, you want a different document in this case. Well, remember that anywhere where you see the case number, it's gonna take you back to the docket of this case. So now I'm in the docket of the case that we were just looking at the complaint. And if I want a different document, well, I can go in and find the other documents that I'm looking for in the case. Two ways to open up a document. One is going to be the little thumbnail. The other is going to be the get document button next to the docket entry that the document is associated with. Another quick note I'll tell you that's an update is we do this entire case history now. What happens is anytime you update a case, we'll let you know exactly what changed from the last time the case was updated. We had folks reach out and say, hey, you told me the case changed, but I can't tell what changed about it. So here we tell you exactly, did a different judge sub in? Was there particular motions on calendar? And there in the case, latest case changes, you'll be able to see what has changed about the case since the last time that you researched it. So as a starting place, that's the way you should think about doing judge research. Start with the analytics, move into the judge's actual data, their rulings, dockets, documents. And again, the way to do that is just type judge colon and then the judge's last name, and that will narrow you into the particular judge's data. Again, the next step is to put in your case dispositive issue, your legal issue that matters. So if I wanted to find Honorable Heidegger and strict liability cases, his strict liability cases, I'm going to run that search. Here I did a search for Judge Freeman and design defect. I wanted to find Honorable Freeman's other design defect cases. So we talked about judges. What about attorneys? What about opposing counsel? If you want to do some research on the attorney that uh, is an adversary in your case, just to find out some basic information, well, you should. In the same way that you research a judge, you should be looking at the attorneys and the law firms that are on the other side. And what are the, some of the things you should be looking at? Well, you should run a search for them. When you're searching in our smart search, again, you're going to search that four buckets of data. So let's say we wanted to pick on Gibson Dunn. We're going to pull rulings for Gibson Dunn's counsel. We're going to pull dockets, high-level overview of all of their cases, documents, documents filed by them, and then verdicts, cases that have gone to verdict. And we'll want to do that same narrowing where we add additional search terms that match um, what we're interested in finding out about opposing counsel. But from a starting place, I recommend doing a search for the law firm or the individual attorney on the dockets tab. So that's going to be, we'll go back one, We'll go back to, so it's going to be in this tab right here. And here I would search for the law firm or the attorney I was listed in, and I would start looking at all of their cases. And what I'd be looking for is how busy are they? How many cases do they have? Um, do they take their cases to trial? Look at the actual dockets themselves and see, do the cases go to trial? Do they settle them before trial? Is it more of a, a demand chop where they just send demands, but they never actually litigate cases? This is all information that you can find out by doing a little bit of research on attorneys and law firms. You can also pull their previously filed documents. One of my favorite aspects, you look up a particular law firm and you look up their cases or similar cases and then see what their filed documents look like. Uh, very often, attorneys follow a particular playbook, particularly with their um, filed documents, because they're starting with an outline just like anyone else's when they're filing documents. And if they have that outline, they're pro you're probably going to get an idea about how they've handled this case in the past and how they're likely to handle it again in the future, which can really set you up to be very strategic. 
So here's an example. I searched for Biznar Chase, which is a large plaintiff's firm. And again, I'm always searching these four buckets of data. So rulings, dockets, documents, and verdicts. So we talked about law firms. We talked about judges. What about using Trellis as a brief bank? Using the entire state trial court system as a brief bank? Absolutely, uh, you should do it. It is an incredible resource. So do remember that you have this resource, that you are not mm, sort of limited to emailing someone and asking if they've done anything or trying to only Google. Instead, you have the state trial court system as a brief bank to find documents that are going to be useful and similar. So let's talk about that. One of the things to remember is that when you're searching on Trellis for filed documents, one, you're searching over 130 million filed documents. So you may think that the, the particular procedural issue or motion that you're dealing with is incredibly unique. And the truth is it could be, but I guarantee you someone out there has done something similar that you can use as a starting place to understand the procedure and to understand how to organize your motion in the first place. The other thing to remember is that you're actually searching the body and text of the file to documents. So you're not just searching the case number, you're not just searching the title of the document, but instead information that's hidden within the body and text of filed documents is now searchable. So here are some examples. I looked up a motion for summary judgment. Remember that there are over 100 million, 130 million filed documents that you can look through. You can narrow to motions that have been granted and use those as a starting place. You can narrow to motions filed before your judge. Let's actually do an example of that. So I'm gonna go back to our site. And again, I'm gonna be in the smart search for all of the substantive legal research, I'm gonna stay in smart search. And let's say you wanted to find an example of a summary judgment motion. I'm just gonna type summary judgment. Now, this is going to search across a lot of cases. So you'll wanna add additional legal issues to narrow you. To use us as a brief bank, you wanna live in the documents tab here. And what we're searching through here are a lot of documents um, that are related to summary judgment motions filed across uh, counties, across the state of California, since we're searching in California right now. But a couple quick notes. Remember that you can narrow to a judge at any point if you just, Grab the judge's last name and do that same trick that we did before. Summary judgment and Judge Frangie. I want to find Honorable Janet Frangie's other summary judgment motions. And as I start to scroll down the page, it is going to load the image of the documents so that I can start to see what I'm looking for. You can do the same thing by county. So if you want to narrow to a particular county, summary judgment motions filed in a particular county, you can do that same trick to narrow, county colon, and then the name of the county. Let's say maybe it's in Fresno. So now I'm looking for summary judgment motions filed in Fresno. So there's lots of ways to continue to narrow and drill down, whether you do it within the search bar, whether you do it within the filters on the left-hand side, you can narrow by judge or county over here as well. So lots of ways to narrow down. But again, to stay really high level on file documents, what do you want? You wanna do the title of the motion that you're looking for and then the legal issues that are relevant, your causes of action, your legal issues that are going to pull up relevant data uh, so you can find really good outlines. What I will say is remember that you're searching the body and text of the file documents. So that means you're going to be searching a lot of documents that are filed. Um, motions are often filed in a package with the notice of the motion, the motion, the memorandum of points and authorities. Because you're searching the body and text of the document, you're searching all of those. So if you want to narrow to a specific document as a part of that package, add and, and then the search terms for that. So if I wanted to find the proposed order for a summary judgment motion, I'm going to type and proposed order. If I want to find the memorandum of points and authorities, the really legal substantive motion practice, I'm going to type and memo. And now I'm pulling up the memorandum of points and authorities 
for summary judgment cases. Now, of course, you'll want to make sure that the legal issues match what you're looking for. But here I am, and I can search through this entire document, see the table of contents, see if it's useful for what I'm looking for. And again, if I want to jump into other documents in the case, click on the case number at any point, or I go back to the page and add additional search terms to narrow me into documents that are going to be useful. So utilizing Trellis as a brief bank is incredibly common, and it is something to really think about because there is really useful data in filed documents. And this, these are documents you wouldn't be able to find if you went to a county court website. And the reason is because on a county court website, you have to know the docket number. So if you don't know the case number, you'll never be able to pull up the underlying documents because you won't know they exist because you don't know the case exists. So this is a way to find other cases that are similar, other documents that are similar that you otherwise wouldn't be able to understand. So what are some other ways to be strategic in searching file documents? Well, you can search by legal issue, you can search by motion type, by outcome, by judge, by case type. What is my favorite, our customer's favorite? It's the mixing and matching. It is searching a particular judge and a particular legal issue, a particular law firm and a particular motion type, right? It's mixing and matching the different classifications to get you to really useful data. Another thing to remember you can do is to narrow by party. So the individual litigants, let's say you are a facing corporation with, or facing litigation with a major corporation, you're, you're suing a major corporation. Well, great. Check their, their other litigation. How often are they facing this issue? Who else is suing them? Not only in your county, in your state, but what about across the nation? Uh, what are the types of matters that they face that are just like this? And how have they handled them in the past? Same if you're representing a large corporation yourself. How have their previous counsel handled their matters? The ability to search by a particular party gives you insight into that party's other litigation that can really set you up for success. So here I did an example, Johnson & Johnson and products liability and memorandum. So what am I looking for here? I'm looking for product liability memorandums where Johnson & Johnson is a party. All right. Oops. Answer to a cross complaint by Best Buy. So again, how do you do it? You look for the corporation's uh, name, you just search the name of the corporation and then you search what you're looking for. If you just wanna find all of 3M is who I picked on here, they're the maker of masks and a variety of other products. If I just wanted to find their other cases, I'm just gonna search 3M. And then I'm gonna be pulling up all of the file documents related, uh, dockets and verdicts related to that party. To look up file documents by judge, again, you're just going to put judge colon and the judge's um, last name, no space, and then you're in the judge's data. Now, this is helpful because if you are stuck in front of a judge, you can get information on their pet peeves and any evidentiary requirements. So you can make sure that you don't get something denied um, that if you had done a little bit of research from the start, you would have been able to have a handle on. And so how do you do that? We did an example earlier, but it's judge, last name, and, and then the motion type that you're looking for. Another thing to remember you can do is utilize a judge's ruling as an outline for a motion to that judge. As I mentioned, judges in California release what are called tentative rulings. And depending on the judge, they can be really, really substantive, have a huge amount of information about the way the judge thinks. Sometimes they're so well organized that you can use the judge's own ruling as an outline for your motion back to the judge on a particular legal issue and really be set up for success there. In general, just remember that you can use the entire state trial court system as a brief bank. Another thing that we do to make it a little bit easier is give you a motions and issues library. So what does that mean? I'll take you on the site for a second. It's right here in motions and issues. And it's gonna be your most common motion types, most common legal issues across the state that you're researching. So across California. 
And what are you gonna find on that page? You're gonna find the basics, a little treatise to give you the background. So if there was a case that you wanted to understand where there was a false claims act in California and you wanna understand how do judges think about that case? What's the legal threshold? Um, are there any requirements that I need to know about? You're gonna find all of that here as a primer, give you the basics. But what you're also gonna find are we're gonna link into cases dealing with the legal issue that you're researching. So this is a way to get an understanding um, of not just the academic, sort of what should the Court of Appeals case law be, but the practical, what a cases, what a, what a trial court cases look like dealing with this issue right now. So not at the appellate level, but at the trial court level, what do these cases actually look like right now? Here I did an example for products liability, and I wanted specifically within products liability to find express warranty legal issues and understand the legal threshold there. Finally, let's talk about verdict data, and then we're going to talk about alerts and open it up for any questions. So verdict data, how do you think about verdicts for similar cases? How do you think about the average for um, cases dealing with particular legal issues, particular injuries, particular states or counties. Well, what we do is we actually will run the average analytics for whatever you're searching for in terms of verdicts. And let's show an example. So the verdicts tab is one way to get in. The other place you probably saw in smart search, verdicts is one of the tabs that I'm searching. So that's a smart search. Um, aspect. But if you specifically know what you're looking for, if you know the judge, the county, the party, the injuries, and you want to narrow very quickly into a particular uh, issue, you can select the state that you're interested in. And then I like to do it in keywords, but you can do it in a couple places. Let's say I wanted to find everywhere where a leg injury is alleged in California. And now what I'm searching specifically are cases in California since 2009, where the case has gone all the way to final verdict. So this won't include cases that settled anywhere, even during trial. It's going to be cases that went all the way to final verdict. And how did those cases come out? And for whatever you're searching, you're going to find the lowest verdict, the highest verdict, the average, and then the median. Now, we give you the median because the average is just always thrown off by a ridiculously high verdict or a ridiculously low verdict. So we actually think that the median is a closer proxy to what average for your search might actually be. Then we give you the decision breakdown. So 50-50, well, at least you know it's not a landslide. These cases are highly contested and the outcomes are spread pretty evenly. And then below the analytics, you're gonna have the data that actually powers the verdict analytics. So what does that mean? I'm going to click on a case and what it's going to take me to is the docket of the case, just like any other docket that we were on. But now it's enhanced with verdict information. So you can find verdicts um, and you can see for yourself, is this case comparable to what you're looking for? Is it useful? Um, is, is it not? And you want to look up other information and this is a way to map not just the verdict, but to map the verdict to the underlying docket, to the case itself. So you can look at the documents, so you can look at the, the filed uh, documents and see, is it useful? What actually happened in this case? The other thing you're going to have added now are the experts. So if there were experts that testified in the case that went all the way to trial, the experts are going to be listed here. And just like anything else, searching a party, searching an attorney, if you click on that expert, it's going to run a search for that expert's other cases. So here you can see he's testified in about six other cases. And from there, I could go and I could look at the expert's verdicts and I could see, are they high stakes cases? Are they low stakes cases? So really get some additional information. And that is the way to think about verdicts from the start of your case, is to go high level and, and try and get an understanding Again, always utilizing the data to make some assumptions about the case that you have currently and what the best way to litigate it is, what the overall valuation is, 
what exposure might be, um, and how you should think about strategy in general. And this data can really help inform those decisions. Finally, let's talk high level about other types of research to do and then show alerts. So what are other types of research you can do at the state trial court level? Well, experts we just talked about, jury instructions. Jury instructions is a good one to start with. Um, there are state-sponsored jury instructions called cases in California. Those are one way to start. And they're actually how I used to start my cases. I would figure out what are the elements that I needed to prove and then work backwards to make sure that you uh, provide all of the evidence to match those elements. But you can also look up specific jury instructions. You can find jury instructions that have been approved before your judge before on very similar issues. And you can start there. So getting really targeted and tailored. Motions to disqualify, you can see bias. Um, what is your, has a particular counsel moved to disqualify a judge before? Why? What did they say in their paperwork? Same with moving uh, for a peremptory challenge against the judge. That is called a 170.6. And this is where in California, if you decide that you want a different judge within a certain number of days, so long as you file that motion, the case will get reassigned. Now you don't get to decide who the case gets reassigned to, but you get to move away from the judge that you're um, currently assigned to. And that can change the entire trajectory of the litigation. The judge really, really does matter. And so being able to do some of the research and data to see is this judge useful for you? Are they gonna be really difficult? Um, you may wanna think about moving to be assigned for another judge. Good faith settlements. This is one where you can find settlement information. So settlement figures usually are confidential, but when you have multiple defendants in a case, the court has to approve one of the defendants being able to settle, which means all of the settlement figures will be live on Trellis and searchable. The other thing to think about is just starting high level. So if it's something where you would otherwise start your research on Google, where do you start? Start it on Trellis, particularly if you are, if it's a state trial court case, start in the state trial court system. And you can go really broad. Here is express warranty. This is just, I wanted from a starting place to understand express warranty legal issues and those cases. What do they look like? What are judges saying in them right now? Um, how, how are they moving forward? So being able to do the high level legal research that you might otherwise think you need to start on Lexis or Westlaw, but instead you can really start in the state trial court system and get a flavor for the case law that's even being cited by the judge for the court of appeals data. So then if you want to go forward and do some of that deep court of appeals research, well, now you know the legal threshold, you know the cases to look up because the trial court judges tell you what they're relying on. Same with class action cases. Class action cases, the settlements have to be approved by the court. That means for their class action cases, you're gonna see exactly what they settled for. What went to the class? What went to the attorneys? So class action cases are entirely viewable throughout the state trial court system, and you can find really, really useful information there. Here I search for jury instructions as an example, showing all the different ways you can dive deep from the very start. Remember that you can search across counties and across states. So you are not narrowed to a particular county, but if you want to narrow to a particular county, you can't. County colon, name the county. And in fact, let's do a quick one for San Diego just as an example. Let's say we want to narrow to San Diego cases in particular. I'm going to do county and then San Diego. No, I didn't do any spaces in there. And now I'm specifically narrowed into cases filed in San Diego. Now, of course, that's a broad search. You want to add additional information. You want to add the judge or the legal issue um, or the particular motion that you're looking at. So, or a party, whatever the case may be, you'll want to add and an additional search terms. But to narrow very quickly into a particular uh, county, you just write county colon and then the name of the county that you're looking for. But you can do the same thing across states. So when you click in a particular state, you're searching across that state. What happens if you click across all of our states? 
then you're searching across the state trial courts of all of those states, all from a single interface. And then finally, let's talk about setting alerts and we can open it up for questions. So what do I mean when I say alerts? Well, it's kind of like it sounds. How do you get notified as things are changing in a case or new cases are being filed? So you can set yourself alerts on our platform for certain parties, for certain judges, um, for new cases. Let's do some examples. I'm going to jump in. And here I am. I'm still in this uh, San Diego. Let's say I wanted to find this particular case, McKinley v. Alexander. And I wanna get notified if anything in this case changes. I wanna get notified every time something changes. I'm gonna press this right here, track case changes. What this does is it sets an alert for me. Now, what does that mean? It means I'm gonna get emailed anytime something changes in this case. So I'll get an email that lets me know exactly what changed in the case and I can come back. And then when I come back here, I'm going to have the case history section tell me exactly what changed since the last time that I looked at it. So you can track particular cases, but you can also track parties and you can also track judges. Really anywhere where you see this little alarm bell, this is going to set an alert for you. And what that alert will do is let's say I wanted to find every other time that Barbara, Barbara McKinley is uh, involved in litigation. I'm going to get notified now anytime so that I can make sure to watch. And this is helpful for opposing counsel. It's helpful for corporations and tracking new cases in general. And so the same thing, let's say I wanted to make sure that I get notified every time Uber gets sued in California. I'm going to track new cases. Now, once I do this, it's going to allow, tell me, hey, your alert is set. I can add other people. Do I want other team members? Do I want other parties involved in the litigation to know about it as well? I'm just gonna put their email address in and they'll get notified as well. You can even set up the alerts for others and exclude yourself. So you make sure if you want someone else to watch it and let you know if something changed, you can do that as well. Now, if you wanna change your alerts, let's say the case has settled, thank God you're done with it and you don't wanna find out anymore. You come right here to the alerts in the profile section, and this is your alerts control panel. This is where I have all of my alerts set, particular legal issues, particular cases, with some examples down at the bottom. And if I'm done with an alert, I don't wanna see any more where Lewis Brisbois has a case in Los Angeles. I'm just gonna click the little trash can. It's gonna throw away that alert. And then I am all set there. If I wanna add a bunch of alerts, I can also add it from this page as well. We find people usually add it from the smart search, but you can do either. The alert preview can be useful to get an idea, sort of a flavor for what you would get as an alert had you set that uh, particular alert for the day before. And that's where you can see, do you need to add additional search terms to make sure that it's more narrow? And then I've taken us through the main use cases. So we've got, for, for state trial court data in general, you've got judges, opposing counsel, brief bank, alerts, so what has changed? What's new with our website? Since you may have seen it in the past, we are building and continuing to add a lot. So for those of you that already know, let's talk about what's new. Jurisdictions. We are continuing, as I mentioned, to expand with additional jurisdictions. And do remember that when we cover a county, it means we go back 15 years of historical docket data, as well as all the cases that are moving forward in real time. We now have the ability to purchase docs. So I mentioned that we have 130 million searchable file documents on our system. There are some counties that require you to purchase documents. San Diego is one of them. And how do you do that? Well, you can do it directly on our site. And the reason I say that you should do it on our site is because it becomes part of a crowdsourced library. So once a document is purchased the first time, Within 24 hours, it's live and searchable on our site, and then it's available for all of your colleagues and peers. And you're also benefiting from all of our law firms and legal departments that are requesting those purchase documents through us as well. So again, if you want to pull a particular case in or, or a particular document in San Diego, I'm going to go back in County San Diego. 
and I'm going to go into the dockets. So now I'm on this case, it's Creighton versus Allstate. And here are the documents. I would press on one of these documents or I'd press on the get document button next to the docket entry for the document that I want. That's going to come up with a pop-up for exactly what the price of the document is if it's a purchase document. If it's not a purchase document, the document will load live on the site and you won't see anything about pricing. It's already part of your subscription. So that is one thing to know. If when you press this document, it pops up asking for additional authorization and telling you the price, that means it has to be purchased. If you press this and the document loads, it is part of your subscription, no additional cost. So we've added the ability to purchase documents across a uh, few cases, a uh, few counties in California. There are many counties in California that are already live and searchable on the site, as well as Kings County, Washington, Arizona, Maryland, and a few others. Uh, we now have document coverage for Los Angeles Superior Court. We provide those documents as a part of your subscription. It is a very expensive county to pull documents in. It's usually a dollar to two dollars a page for file documents in Los Angeles Superior Court. That's part of your subscription. It comes with it. So you want to do that same thing. You go onto the docket page and press the get document button. What happens is we pull that document for you, email the PDF to you, and within 24 hours, then that document is live and searchable on our site for all of your colleagues. We've also added state rules, additional judge analytics, verdicts, and expert research to our site within the last year as well. If you have a question on where searchable documents are already live and on our site, here's some of the counties where you can search uh, documents, where you can search the body and text of the file documents already. And these are, of course, all included with the subscription. This is the Los Angeles Superior Court document that I was talking about where it's included with your subscription. Yes, it's a county where you have to purchase documents, but we cover the cost for you. So your Los Angeles documents certainly request through us. The other thing we talked about is the purchase documents are part of a crowdsourced library. So that database continues to grow every single day with documents that get purchased by our large law firms and our legal departments. And then finally, for anyone who's interested in potentially talking to us about their enterprise, their law firm getting access, feel free to simply reach out and we do complimentary enterprise trials. We're happy to get you going. But of course, if you're a member with San Diego, then you will have access uh, on the site and also through remote access through your platform. So very excited. And now I will open it up to any questions. All right, we had a, someone asking if it's their first attempt to use Trellis, how easy is it to navigate what you've pointed out? Well, it's a good question. I think what you'll wanna think about is getting in there and playing around. It's kind of like Google, right? So when you're on our main search bar, this is your Google, so you just start playing. Do you wanna look up breach of contract cases. You want to search, just start searching. And what you'll find is as you start to search, you're going to become more familiar with the types of data that you're pulling up. Again, anything you're searching in the smart search, loading up these four buckets of data. So if I wanted to find ruling on a breach of contract, now I'm in this case and I can understand breach of contract. What is the, the, the code of civil procedure? that's used? What is the um, Court of Appeals case that the judge cites? So all of this is information that I recommend getting on there and playing, whether it be looking for a legal issue, a judge, a party, um, a case. Oh, that's one note I will say. Let's say you know the case number for the case that you're looking for. Now, one of the things that's great about Trellis is you don't need to know the case number. You can search by the judge or a party or whatever the case may be. But let's say you know the docket number and you want to get right to the case. You're just going to put the docket number in quotations. And now here in the docket, it's going to have that specific case that I was just looking at. So do know that's a quick shortcut to getting to a document where you know it exists already. So we try and make it super intuitive to utilize the platform, but you're going to get more and more comfortable with it the more you search around. Um, on your own. 
you know, I'll add to that as a fairly new user of it myself, although I've been trying to help patrons as I learn myself, I find it pretty user friendly. I think the way that it's laid out in the different type of search you can do and then the different filters that you can use really, you know, once you've gone in and played around with it, I think you'll be at a more, uh, you know, a higher level of comfort with it. But, you know, come in and to the library and use it and play with it. I don't think you can break it. <laughs> so, uh, and we, we can certainly give you suggestions or help you because we here at the library have been really um, playing with it for the last year and, and working with it. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention, Nicole, while we're waiting to see if there's other questions is, you know, you, you talked about using Trellis as a brief bank. That, that's been huge here at the library. A lot of patrons have done that. And one thing I've realized is that not only can you find things like briefs, um, memorandums, you mm -hmm. can find um, filed court forms. And I've cool. even been able to do that with the number of the form. You know, some court, California court forms have a specific identifying number. I've just put that in, in the California jurisdiction and boom, you know, here are examples of that form filed by others. And I think, um, especially for our pro se patrons that don't know, have any idea what that form should look like filled out, it's really helpful to see other people's examples of filed documents. Yeah. So I just saw that we have an attendee who had hand raised, unfortunately, in this webinar format. We, we can't speak to you, but if you could put your question in Q&A, please do, and um, we'd be happy to answer it. So yeah, the finding the court forms has been kind of a, a fun thing, and I know um, several patrons have and really excited to find those examples of other people's filed forms. That's awesome to hear. I've been mean, very, very happy. And it's because we're searching the body and text of those documents that you're able to find it from the form number. The other thing it made me think about is, let's say there's a specific procedural rule and you want to find out what that what that is. The best way to search it is just to put in the number of mm -hmm. the statute and it'll pull up cases dealing with that statute or the judge talking about it. So instead of putting all of the context, let's say it's a, a civil code of procedure just put the number in and you don't have to say all the different ways that someone could say civil code of procedure, which in the courts, there's many. Um, and I find just searching the number is really the, the best way to go. That's a great tip. Okay, this question, I'll go ahead and answer. It's about North County access. So we don't have a physical North County presence at this time. That should be changing next year. Uh, stay tuned, keep on, on our website and uh, find out more information about that as it develops. But the remote access is available to our borrowers. So if you were a borrower here, which you can join for as little as $50, I'll just make a plug for that. Um, the $50 borrower level does provide you with the remote access. That means you can access this from your home, from your office, wherever you are, and you do not have to come downtown to the library. So I just wanna put that out there if it wasn't clear from the beginning. And again, that's only for borrowers, but other patrons who don't have a borrowing account are welcome to come downtown and you can use the, uh, use the trellis on our computers here. That's a great question. Just about a minute, if anyone else has a question, please take advantage of this opportunity to speak to the founder and CEO of Trellis, the best source of information out there. Okay, great. Um, Kathleen just mentioned that she will use the remote. That's fantastic. And if you need any help with how to do that, you know, contact us at the reference desk, refdesk at sdlawlibrary.org or uh, call us 619-531-3900. Um, and we can help you out with how to how to navigate and get to it. Um, and yes, the PowerPoint and the recording. Um, I don't know about the PowerPoint. I don't think I have that, but maybe Nicole can provide it to me. The recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. And that should be happening within the next few days. So thank you for asking that good question as well. All right, I think that wraps things up and we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this wealth of information about Trellis. It, it might've sounded overwhelming you know, to the listeners <laughs> totally. yeah, because there is so much going on with Trellis. I can't believe the development that's happened and how much has been added to this platform in the last year but it's all really useful tools and information. So 
definitely, if you haven't tried using it, I really encourage you to. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.